Okay, welcome everybody. I trust you can hear at the back. Okay, good. Um, my name is Meg Russell. I am a professor of British and Comparative Politics in the UCL Department of Political Science and director of the Constitution Unit in the, uh, in the UCL Department of Political Science. And it's my enormous pleasure to be here to welcome you all to this event and to introduce Peter Riddell, who's Professor Sir Peter Riddle. Yeah, British. I should say Riddle. <laughs> um, I thought you might get a revolt. <laughs> should, uh, I should know this after all these years. Uh, um, who is here to give his inaugural lecture? This is an enormously happy event. Um, it is one of our departmental inaugural lecture, uh, part of our inaugural lecture series, but it's a slightly unusual inaugural lecture. I think it's uh, fair to say it's um, a, a sort of late career inaugural lecture in your case, Peter, which is, which is not entirely the standard. Um, Peter became an honorary professor in the department last year after a very long and distinguished career elsewhere, which I will say a few words about. Um, he spent around 20 years uh, working for the Financial Times, including as economic correspondent, political editor, and Washington bureau chief. He then rather astonishingly, astonishingly spent about another 20 years working for the Times, um, where he was political columnist and chief political commentator. Um, and during that time, he was a very highly regarded journalist, one of those must-read columnists to whom you have to turn uh, for the most insightful and well-informed analysis. He really knew the political system inside out. But he was also, and this is no coincidence in terms of being able to write good quality copy, a journalist very highly trusted by his subjects and sources. A man of uh, very high integrity with a mission to enable his readers to really understand their political system and to hold it to account rather than chasing cheap headlines. This seriousness was also reflected in Peter's other outputs. He's the author of no fewer than 10 books, as well as numerous book chapters and articles in academic journals. Then in the latter part of his career, uh, Peter moved, I think in a welcome way from our point of view, given the level of the depth of knowledge that he had, from observing and analyzing the system, increasingly towards being a player in that system itself, though always uh, from a point of view of political neutrality. He's held numerous uh, government, various government advisory roles, and he was appointed a privy councillor in 2010. In 2012, he became the director of the Institute for Government, which is a position he held until 2016. The IFG is a very important uh, independent body which researches, advises, and educates on the principles of good government, including upholding ministerial and civil service standards, and wider constitutional matters such as devolution and the role and functions of parliament. In 2016, when Peter departed the IFG, he became even more directly involved in government and the maintenance of standards through becoming commissioner for public appointments, a role that he held until 2021. And he was then deservedly knighted in 2022. Beyond his paid employment, Peter's roles have included being chair of the Hansard Society, and he's also been a long-term friend and collaborator of the Constitution Unit, including serving on our council for as long as I can remember. Indeed, when I published my first book on Lord's Reform 23 years ago, it was Peter who introduced me at the launch party. So it's particularly pleasing to be able, perhaps a bit belatedly, to return that favor tonight, Peter. All of what I've already said should make clear why Peter is a brilliantly qualified candidate to become an honorary professor in our department and with an attachment to the Constitution Unit. Key interests of his converge completely with ours, as demonstrated, for example, through his books, Parliament Under Pressure, later revised as Parliament Under Blair, and in defense of politicians, with the crucial bracketed caveat, in spite of themselves. He, he's an ob acute observer of politics who appreciates the joint importance of political structures and of political culture. And he's clearly driven by a firm commitment to making both aspects of politics work. A key theme has been the importance of upholding political standards, including through appropriate scrutiny and the delicate business of maintaining public trust, but always recognizing 
the essentially political nature of our constitution and to an extent of any constitution. We've heard a lot of talk in recent years about the decline of the so-called good chaps culture, a phrase coined by Peter's old and dear friend, Peter Hennessy. When confronted with actors who refuse to be bound by widely accepted but unwritten rules, any constitution will struggle, and perhaps particularly ours. So now, having come through a tumultuous period in British politics, it's an important time to be reviewing our structures and our culture and how to maintain political standards and public trust. And Peter will be an enormously important contributor to those debates. So we greatly look forward to working with him at UCL. And we, in, particularly, in particular, immediately look forward to what he's going to have to say tonight. On this happy occasion, it's lovely to be joined by Peter's wife, Avril, and his daughter, Emily, and many of his old friends and colleagues, as well as others who simply want to hear his thoughts on this important topic. And of course, we're also importantly joined by Jack Straw, former member of parliament for Blackburn and a minister throughout the Blair and Brown governments as Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary, Leader of the House of Commons, Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor. When Peter's finished his lecture, Jack is going to offer a brief response. And then after those two contributions, there'll be an opportunity to turn it over to you for a Q&A before we invite you to join us for a drink in the Jeremy Bentham room, to which we will direct you when the time is right. That's more than enough from me. Let me hand over to Professor Sir Peter Riddle. Thank you very much indeed, Meg, for that introduction. 23 years ago, your first book. Um, I think we'll have a later discussion on how much of what you suggested in the book has been achieved since then. And uh, we, we've got one uh, a former Lord Speaker who I would have views on that, on that topic and may want to raise them later. It's very, uh, I'm delighted to have been asked to deliver the inaugural lecture as an honorary professor at the Constitution Unit, an organization I've long admired and with whom I am now working on a report on constitutional watchdogs and ethical regulation. And I'm delighted that the response will come from Jack Straw, an old friend who has thought extensively about these issues and was closely involved with the constitutional changes of the late 90s and early 2000s, where the Constitution Unit played an important role. I considered the main themes over a long time, uh, as you mentioned, Meg, initially as a journalist, seeing scrutiny at first hand, then successively as chair of the Hansard Society, director of the Institute for Government, commissioner for public appointments, and now working at the Constitution Unit. I'm also very glad to see in the audience the number of people I've worked with very closely over that period um, from various, also from various parts of my life, and I look forward to them raising issues with me. I'm afraid I won't necessarily be covering all the issues they're interested in because there's a, obviously a limit in time and a theme. My theme is ministers all also have rights balancing executive prerogatives and executive scrutiny. This title might seem to be unfashionably contrarian since ministers are now widely seen as the main usurpers, disruptors perhaps, of established constitutional conventions and standards in public life. This debate is one aspect of what might be described as culture wars between, on the one hand, the executive, on the, and on the other hand, parliament and regulators, seeking to sustain checks and balances on the actions of government. Boris Johnson and his defenders like to invoke his mandate from the December 2019 general election in almost presidential terms to brush aside those questioning his government's actions. On the other side, a wide range of political, legal, and academic critics accuse ministers of an unprecedented violation of long-established principles, conventions, and norms, in some cases, even the rule of law. In this lecture, I will discuss the significance of recent developments, assess how exceptional they are, and examine what can be done. This is only partly a matter of laws or formal codes, and as much a question of norms and conventions. In particular, I want to address the balance between the rights of the executive and of those regulating and scrutinizing it. These are essentially matters of political accountability, and only partly of enforceable legal rights. The two, of course, overlap. I don't share some ministers' claims that judges have gone too far. There's no real evidence that judicial review is being abused in the judgments of courts, nor has that been shown in various studies of the issue. This is a sensitive area where language and tone uh, matter 
both among politicians and judges. However, I do have concerns that some campaigning bodies see the courts as a way of pursuing essentially political objectives by muddling what they dislike and what is against the law. I'm also not going to discuss scrutiny of the efficiency and effectiveness of government, a massive and important subject in its own right. I focus rather on the political and constitutional mechanisms for scrutiny of ethics, proper conduct in government, everything captured by the phrase standards in public life. This is a tricky area, since what is seen as perfectly acceptable to someone, usually in government, appears as wholly unacceptable, even perhaps corrupt, to the others outside. We have, of course, been here many times before. There is nothing new about complaints about an overbearing executive usurping its powers and its exercise of patronage. This was a central theme of 17th century history and opposition to the old corruption was the rallying cry of reformers such as Cobbett in the late 18th and early 19th century against the highly paid offices, sinecures and pensions enjoyed by the aristocracy until they were abolished in the wave of reform of the 1830s and 1840s. There have been recurrent cycles of complaint about the misuse of power and patronage leading to demands for new institutional checks, generally after one party has been in office for a long time. This was seen in the early 1960s, the heyday of Penguin's What's Wrong With Books. The mid to late 1970s, then directed at both main parties with talk of a crisis of governability and an elective dictatorship. The mid 1990s over cash for questions, in the late 2000s over loans for peerages and MPs expenses, and since 2019 over everything from prorogation via Partygate to ignoring Parliament and international law to personal patronage. On each earlier occasion, new rules or, regula or regulators have been introduced, notably following the establishment of the Committee on Standards in Public Life, the Nolan Committee, in 1994, and acceptance by Sir John Major the following year of the thrust of most of its wide-ranging recommendations in what Sir Humphrey Appleby would have described as a bold, uh, even courageous decision, which didn't, which didn't do much good with either Conservative MPs or the public. Indeed, it was Sir John Major who overruled some officials and insisted that the CSBL should be a permanent body. The original Nolan report was a very British exercise conducted by eminent figures in public life based on the views of other eminent figures in public life without any detailed research at all. As the late Professor Anthony King told me, the much discussed Nolan principles were drawn up on the back of an envelope. The principles, selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership are fine as general aspirations, but they're harder to translate into operational guidelines and codes. The committee has proved its worth since the mid-1990s with a series of reports addressing these dilemmas and new problems, not least because it is focused on its oversight role rather than to try and duplicate the role of individual regulators and to investigate uh, specific complaints and abuses. Public life now would be much better if, if most of its recommendations had been accepted and fully implemented. I'm glad I played a small part in ensuring its survival when I conducted a review of the committee for the Cabinet Office just over a decade ago, uh, um, when powerful forces in Whitehall favoured either its abolition or the equally unacceptable solution of putting the committee into hibernation until needed. I don't have time this evening to discuss the specific allegations or each of the new initiatives. Rather, I want to examine the overall pattern, drawing in particular on my experience as Public Appointments Commissioner. So I'll not be saying much in detail about the legal system and the courts or parliament. I don't mean in any way to underrate their importance as checks on the executive. What we've seen over 40 years has been a gradual codification of British public life in response to scandals affecting the behavior of MPs or political parties and ministers. I dislike references actually to a good chap's view of the past when leaders, when leaders allegedly knew how to behave, partly because I'm instinctively suspicious of golden ageism. Past ministers, MPs and officials, though almost all were male chaps, um, were not conspicuously good, hence the need for greater regulation. Underlying these pressures and more general demands for constitutional reform 
was what Douglas heard in a lecture in 1998 called the Whig view of the Constitution. Quotes, the belief that the main purpose of Parliament is to limit government because it is not, if it is not strenuously limited, it will return in one way or another to the wicked ways of the Stuarts. That it will reassert by prerogative against the interests of the people. Lord Hurd contrasted this with the Tory view that the government must be carried on and that Parliament exists to create and sustain the government and not entirely to scrutinise it. Boris Johnson, as I think we can agree, unquestionably in the Stuart and now perhaps Jacobite tradition, the world king over the water. To what extent, to what extent are recent events merely another episode in a long cycle of excess by a long-serving government? and the pressures for a rebalancing shown by the shift between Whig and Tory views of government and accountability. The recent challenges to long extent recognised conventions are greater than in the past. It's not just the many examples of where ministers, and particular Boris Johnson, flouted the accepted norms of public life as embodied, embodied in known principles. In the words of William Haig in summer 2022, less than a year ago, Johnson had displayed, quotes, disloyalty to the conventions of government and institutions of government and to the massed ranks of colleagues who did their best to support him, but ultimately quit in disgust or told him to go, close quotes. And Mr. Haig was not alone amongst former conservative leaders in taking that view. As significant was the essentially presidential view of Mr. Johnson and his allies, that as prime minister who led his party to a big victory, at the 2019 election, he enjoyed a personal mandate embodying the will of the people, distinct from both parliamentary and independent, distinct both from parliament and independent regulators. As Simon Case, the cabinet secretary, told the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee of the Commons in what turned out to be the final phase of the Johnson administration, quotes, the government of the day believes it has a mandate test established boundaries. They take a robust view of the national interest and how the government should protect and focus very much on accountability to people in Parliament and not on the unelected advisory structures. The Johnson approach has amounted to rejection of long established checks and balances, not just by unelected advisory structures, but also through bypassing Parliament by the use of skeleton bills and Henry VIII's clauses to avoid detailed scrutiny. Moreover, trumpeting accountability to the people via the commons can be deceptive, since there is a distinction between the form and substance of accountability. It's no good saying that MPs and voters should have the final say, as indeed they should, if they don't know what is happening. The central role of regulators and constitutional watchdogs is to investigate alleged abuses and to advise. It is, of course, possible to argue that the, the 2019-22 period was an aberration and that there was there has been a correction since then, uh, um, particularly since Rishi, Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister. After all, he did appoint an independent advisor in ministerial interests when there had been speculation in the final Johnson phase that Lord Guyte would not be replaced after he had been the second advisor to resign in less than two years. Mr Sunak also responded quickly to Sir Laurie Magnus's robust report into the tax affairs of Nadine Zawawi, but we still await the long-awaited, uh, long-promised responses of the government to the Committee on Standards in Public Life report of November 2021 on, on strengthening um, the role of constitutional watchdogs and regulators and the parallel Public Administration Committee report of last December, let alone a number of other ethical uh, cases and reports. There also remain several worrying signs in the attitude of some ministers to breaking international law and criticizing the legal system. Moreover, Dominic Raab's departure has raised questions not only about complaints procedures, but also has also highlighted long-running tensions and worse in ministerial civil service relations. We cannot pretend that recent excesses were just a one-off. The fact that the ministerial code could be bent and breached, patronage abused, and adequate parliamentary scrutiny bypassed can't be brushed off. These events expose weaknesses in current arrangements. Moreover, they are part of a broader polarization of politics linked to the political upheavals associated with Brexit, but certainly not solely caused by it. 
a populist revolt against established parties and politicians is common to most representative democracies, leading to what Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zitblat describe in their 2018 book, How Democracies Die, as threats to the norms of mutual toleration and institutional forbearance. They define mutual toleration as an acceptance by one party that their rivals have a right to exist, uh, 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 to compete for power and to govern. Their rivals, not enemies. Institutional forbearance means acceptance of restraints on the exercise of power. Of course, Donald Trump and his Republican allies have been and are the most outrageous breakers of these norms and their rejections of the 2022 presidential election result and their efforts to make governing unworkable. But a similar winner-takes-all approach has been seen here too. There is an overwhelming case for strengthening current safeguards and no shortage of proposals for institutional and regulatory changes. We are in the familiar pre-election stage where the reformers, the Whigs, are both frustrated and full of ideas. We don't have a formal separation of powers, of course, but we do recognize the need for checks and balances through the courts to take unlawful action, uh, to tackle unlawful action by the executive and by parliament and various watchdogs. But these are checks, not replacements for ministers. Therefore, while I'm sympathetic to the intentions by, behind many of the reform proposals, I am concerned that some ignore and underplay the legitimate rights of an elected government. The initial problem is to define what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. There is a spectrum from outright corruption via breaches of, of codes, uh, via breaches of codes of an administrative character to decisions with which someone disagrees. But the distinctions can often be blurred. At one extreme, it is clear that taking bribes in return for favors is illegal as well as unethical. Lying to the House of Commons has similarly been seen as wrong, but as the current Privileges Committee inquiry shows, we're quickly into gray areas of whether making a statement containing misleading information was intentional or not. I'm skeptical about the practicality of making, court, of, ma of making lying by politicians illegal or to give powers to the Speaker of the Commons or a select committee to monitor political statements for their truth. The key is to require ministers publicly to correct misleading or false statements. To take another example from the area of public appointments, should people who have made large donations to a political party be barred from holding public appointments? The correlation between the two is often widely parade, portrayed as corruption. But the current rule is that, is that for all but a few constitutional watchdogs, significant political activity, and that's defined as making a registrable donation of a certain size, being a candidate or speaking on behalf of a party, should neither be a qualification nor a bar to appointment. We don't want to demonize party activity or support. It's an important public service. Indeed, there have been many party donors who have also performed important public services. Acceptance of party activity can, however, become a wide loophole, with donors in practice being given favored access to obtaining government contracts, such as the VIP lane for PPE supplies during COVID, or effectively buying peerages and then not playing any real part in the work of the House of Lords. That has fueled demands to depoliticize the process calling for all appointments to be made on merit. But what does this mean? The phrase on appointment on merit is in fact deceptive. It sounds virtuous like passing an exam. It's a tempting thought that if you want to chair the BBC, Ofcom or the British Museum, you should sit a competitive exam, say on the content of the archers, or perhaps your knowledge of Greek statues. But we are not in imperial China. Public appointments could never work that way since there is no absolute measure of merit to assess candidates. It's bound to be relative to what is appropriate at the time and for the role. Moreover, someone has to agree the criteria. There is what I've called a system of constrained patronage, which is often misunderstood. Ever since the post-Nolan report creation of regulation in this area, there's been a two-tier system even though the details have changed over the years. The first tier is open competition based on public advertisement of vacancies and the job and personal criteria, with a panel picking candidates 
assessed as appointable or above the line, with no preference being expressed between them. The second tier is choice by ministers amongst those joint judges as appointable. So it is not really selection by merit, since the final choice is entirely political. Ministers can also suggest names and comment on the shortlist. The first tier of open competition has been seen as a fig leaf for unrestrained ministerial patronage. But that's wrong. The sifts and interviews don't just or always produce a list of appointable candidates who ministers wanted in the first place. Some favoured candidates are judged unappointable. I can mention Paul Dacre because he outed himself as having been rejected. I can't mention other names because um, of necessary confidentiality. There have, however, been many other um, examples of similarly um, uh, uh, preferred candidates by ministers, even former ministers themselves, being regarded as unacceptable. And I'm glad to say that in my time as commissioner, and I gather so far under my successor, ministers have not exercised their power under the governance code to appoint someone assessed as unappointable. Perhaps they feared the adverse publicity, though there were a number of very close shaves in my time. This process is at one level inherently biased in favour of ministers, but a central role for ministers was envisaged in the original Nolan report of 1995. After all, these appointments are within the public sector for which ministers are accountable to parliament. And ministers of all governments have wanted to avoid appointing people who will be critics of their policies. However, there's a fine line between this and appointing allies as a reward for past support or because they will be loyal in future. It's a question of balance. In most of the thousands of public appointments made, there's absolutely no problem. The choices are uncontroversial. And even where an appointee does have a political background, that doesn't automatically make them uncritical about the government. Far from it. It's a mistake to focus too narrowly on political views in most cases. Nevertheless, the excesses of recent years have led to calls for both a more independent system of appointment and more independent appointees. Independent, another slippery term. It depends on the eye of the beholder. In the eyes of someone on the right, independence means being part of the metropolitan centre, the liberal elite, the blob, the establishment, whatever other cliche you like. It's possible to reach approximate definitions of not being involved in significant political activity and being separate from a department. But as Charles Moore has often argued, independence is assumed to be an unquestioned good when it's also a form of selection and independent appointers and appointees are often drawn from former civil servants, Krangocrats, and the like. The process can be too cosy with like selecting like, which is why I believe ministers have to be involved. A key decision is to ring fence those institutions whose function and credibility depend on being separate from the executive, such as those dealing with the civil service, ethics and integrity in government, and public appointments. Unlike appointments to executive bodies implementing public policy, which should continue as at present, appointments to constitutional watchdogs should be subject to more safeguards than many now are. Only the Civil Service Commission and the lobby, lobby registrar are established in primary legislation. The rest are entirely subject to prerogative powers, and the independent advisor on ministerial interests is not even appointed by open competition. Moreover, despite some changes last year, the independent advisor still has to obtain the consent of the Prime Minister to launch an inquiry. For these constitutional watchdogs, the role of ministers should continue, but should be constrained. There are already various proposals for strengthening the independent element in the advisory interview panels for appointments for a limited number of posts. At one extreme, you could even adopt the practice of the Judicial Appointments Commission, where interview panels put forward one candidate for each vacancy, with the Justice Secretary just having a veto rather than a choice, which, which remains appropriate for most other cases. There will then be a lively debate how wide this category should be. Should it also cover the chairs of the BBC, the Charity Commission, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and the sector regulators? There will be a test this will be a test for opposition politicians about how far they really want 
to depoliticize senior appointments. My hunch is not very much. Parliament is the other formal element in this rebalancing. Not in making appointments itself, but by strengthened pre-appointment hearings and in, a more, in more regular systems of accountability. There are various permutations here, from enhanced consultation to veto power. The executive has to be willing to be more open with the legislature, while MPs on select committees have to show a commitment to holding the executive to account, as some members are inconsistent in doing now by not showing up to hearings. Many watchdogs and regulators also have so far been reluctant to engage select committees as part of a more open debate about their advice. Advice should be more widely known and debated. What I've discussed so far will be seen by many as tinkering and incrementalism that would, I hope, produce a more robust system which inspires more public confidence alongside with other changes in the effectiveness of Parliament. Others would go further and there are far-reaching proposals to create a powerful ethics and integrity commission and a body with a specific brief of fighting corruption. But there are dangers here. There's a big difference between the independence of the courts and of any regulatory body, though being dubbed enemies of the people was uncomfortable enough for the senior judiciary six years ago. I'm skeptical about whether either politicians or the public, let alone parts of the media, but in practice welcome a single ethics regulator with greater powers, which, which could overshadow Parliament and challenge the principles of democratic accountability. There are virtues in separate regulators with different roles and functions, even though there is scope for much closer coordination, as well as the continuing oversight role of the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Moreover, there are also wider issues about whether the focus of the constitutional watchdogs should follow the trend in the private sector, especially financial services, um, uh, uh, with a greater focus on uh, compliance and prevention. One of the biggest largely unnoticed changes in my time as commissioner was the introduction, introduction thanks to my senior advisors rather than me, um, of a system of annual compliance audits of the performance of departments. The emphasis was on an improvement rather than finding fault, and the annual exercise was liked by departments and led to the sharing of best practice. This lecture has been set within the established um, uh, constitutional structure and conventions of ministerial accountability. I've not discussed proposals for a more formal written constitution in which parliamentary decisions would be subject to overrule by the courts. Not in my view a likely or, or desirable prospect. Nor have I discussed federalism and devolution or the implications for executive prerogatives and the balance of the legislature of the fixed term parliament legislation and its repeal all within a decade. If the act turned out to be seriously flawed, I believe it was wrong to return the power to call a general election before the five-year limit exclusively to the Prime Minister, rather than leave the final decision with MPs on a simple, a simple majority vote. But even what I've discussed would imply big changes. Much could be done now without either primary or secondary legislation, for instance, in the operation of the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, or in the role of the independent advisor on ministerial interests in handling complaints. Other changes, for example, in the regulation of public appointments or various codes, would require orders in council. Putting the constitutional watchdogs on a statutory basis, as proposed by Lord Anderson of Ipswich's bill, implementing the proposals I mentioned earlier um, from the Committee on Standards in Public Life, is in theory straightforward, but requires scarce parliamentary time. The government has already shown its reluctance to accept limits on its prerogative powers in its coolness towards Lord, Lord Norton of Laos' widely supported bill to put the House of Lords Appointments Commission on a statutory basis and to give it a stronger vetting role. The government's objections confuse an enhanced advisory role with ultimate ministerial responsibility and accountability, the central theme of this evening's lecture. The most important influences are not necessarily changes to institutions and codes, which I've mainly discussed so far, but behavioral. It's the attitudes and conduct of, of specific ministers that matter, going back to the themes of mutual toleration and institutional forbearance, which I mentioned earlier. 
None of what, none of what I've suggested will work unless those involved exercise self-restraint in the exercise of their powers. During my period as commissioner, I was struck by the contrast between the May and Johnson premierships, both working with the same, within the same gov governance code, incidentally the government's governance code, not mine, but implementing it in very different ways related largely to the personal approaches to power and patronage of the two prime ministers and their close allies. You can't legislate for that. What you can do is to strengthen safeguards and to clarify and make more transparent the differing roles of advisors and ministers. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Um, when Meg introduced uh, you, Peter, uh, she, she talked about uh, your extraordinary and very distinguished career as a journalist, um, I mean, as well as the other things you've, you've done subsequently. But just as I was writing, this da writing down the word, she talked about the trust uh, in which you were held. And one of the absolutely striking and singular things about you uh, as a journalist was that it wasn't only your judgment that was trusted, but also your personal word that was trusted. There, I mean, there, the best journalists are those who are, are, are trusted personally, uh, as well as whose, whose judgment is trusted. But they, those who, who manage to combine these two elements of trust are, are few and far between. And it was a huge tribute to Peter that he, he, he operated in this way and was also remarkably successful rising uh, uh, through the, the ranks of, of the Financial Times, including, as we've heard from Meg, as uh, the Washington correspondents, uh, and then th uh, through a uh, similar, but, but rather, if you like, uh, more uh, 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 difficult uh, ranks uh, in, in the Times newspaper, as well as going on, uh, and a few journalists have ever done that, to, to, to these other uh, Posts like the Institute for Government, and it's worth remembering that it was Peter who got the help to get the Institute of Government going. There have been previous attempts made to get a body like an Institute of Government going, but uh, it was thanks to the pioneers now uh, 11 years ago, of whom Peter was the key, that it's already established a, a, a fantastic reputation as a source of knowledge and wisdom and information about how we govern Britain uh, and, and what we should do next. Now, I, 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 I enjoyed the lecture. I, I, you mentioned at the beginning, Peter, about uh, Brexit. I said that wasn't the only factor. I wonder whether the thing that, that emerged in Brexit was um, the extraordinary deep uh, cultural, uh, sociological division in our society, which had not been that much noticed. I mean, I like to pride myself that on the doorsteps of Blackburn uh, uh, and in my, on my soapbox, I, I, and not, not least in the, um, on, on, on the, it, 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 at Ewood Park, um, the, I, I was aware of this, but not, I, I wasn't even aware of it to the extent that it was. And it, what I, I, I what might suggest is that that explosion uh, and, and, and shock to the establishment in, if you like, uh, and people's expectations has created really very serious divisions in, in our, our culture uh, uh, and, and approach, um, which is going to take quite a long time to heal. And I'm resonating in my head is a, an observation by Chief Justice Earl Warren. Chief Justice of the United States, who observed that uh, liberty exists in the hearts of, of, uh, of men and women, and when it dies there, no court, no constitution can save it. And I've always thought, that it's a rather dismal observation, but it's absolutely accurate that even in the United States, I mean, actually, in, this is decades before Trump, um, just, despite their overlay of a black letter law to, to a much greater extent, than in the UK, if you haven't got a, 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 a sort of a, a cultural consensus uh, about uh, how you 
your society should operate, um, you're going to have some real difficulties. And it's, I, th I think jo what Johnson did, knowingly or unknowingly, um, when he wrote two essays, one in favour of Brexit and one against, um, and then decided where his interests lay in the short term, um, that he, he broke that uh, uh, cultural uh, consensus and we're still trying to recover from it. So I'm interested to know whether you've got any views about how we do. The second thing is I, I, I cheered you when you talked about the fact that there's no, uh, uh, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not in favour of golden ageism um, because, um, the, and you, you, you then almost parenthetically say that it's worth just remembering that the regulators that have been established over a period of uh, particularly the post-war decades have been established precisely to deal with particular mischiefs which have been exposed. I, um, I was in the, in the vanguard, as Meg mentioned, of um, a very large number of constitutional changes which we introduced uh, between uh, 1997 and uh, 2010. And at, at an equivalent period, in opposition in 94, 95, at least I hope it's an equivalent period, but there's no, we can't be certain about these things. Um, uh, those of us involved in putting it together, um, uh, our, our prescriptions for the future, were really excited about what we could do. And I certainly, um, but as it turned out, very naively yeah. believed that if more rights were made available, uh, there was much uh, more daylight on the way government uh, operated. Um, that uh, that would strengthen trust in uh, British political institutions, and, and, and one of the, and it's just just to say that it's just worth bearing in mind that um, certainly in the when I worked as a special advisor in the in the seventies, um, there was no no regulation worth speaking of of what MPs earned. Ted Heath, who was taking a lot, significantly large sums of money when he finished as prime minister uh, from the Chinese government, um, uh, which simply refused to uh, even disclose anything on the register. There's no, no requirement to, to disclose total earnings in those days. And just shrugged his shoulder, but previous, uh, in, in the 50s and 60s, members of the shadow cabinet um, routinely um, earned money as advisors for people. Harold Wilson, was, as leader of the opposition, um, earned a significant but un undisclosed fees for Montague Mayer, uh, who were importers of timber uh, from the Soviet Union. And everybody knew about this within the system. No one said a word, because uh, you, you wouldn't, uh, you, might, you know, it wasn't something you, sh you should uh, disclose. Um, as a special advisor, I'd be uh, phoned or, or asked by uh, one of the ministers to find uh, people to go on various regional boards, sometimes national boards. And so I'd phone the regional office of the Labour Party and ask them for suggestions. And there'd be then a discussion. Oh, yes, says old Fred, uh, he's, he's being difficult. We could do with giving him a job. So uh, a job would be found for old Fred. And both sides did this. So there was, a, there, there was a sort of a, 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 an under, understanding that you, you kept quiet about it. So now um, you've had this uh, over a period of 40 years, um, extraordinary movement towards uh, openness. Um, there were no select committees going when I f first went in there to speak of. There was a public accounts committee and a couple of specific ones in, in 79. And somehow or other, Norman St. John Stevens tricked uh, Margaret Thatcher in, into establishing uh, the current system. And that's grown and grown and grown. And they've become more and more independent um, as um, not least through the, the changes introduced by or sponsored by Tony Wright in, at the end of 20, uh, 2009, 2010. So they're very powerful. You've got the Human Rights Act, which does uh, provide for um, f further uh, uh, adjudication in the courts of a wide range of, of rights which wasn't, weren't there before. We, I was very keen on that. You've got the Ministerial Code, which people know what's in it now. Uh, uh, there was a hell of a fuss uh, just as to whether it should be made, made public. Uh, people know that the intelligence agencies exist and what they do, and there are regulators for that. Um, when uh, and this is public now, but when uh, and, and the, by the way, the uh, security service said I uh, gave you authority to disclose this, as I did in my book. But it, 
in, in the 1960s when, uh, and early 70s when uh, there, there was considerable record keeping on what, what my family uh, were doing uh, in the Loughton branch of the CND. Um, um, there was the, the very existence of the security service MI5 or MI6 or GCHQ was a, what was called not a ver. No one uh, officially, these three bodies didn't exist. Uh, and there was certainly no statutory control over whose phone they tapped or anything, anything like that, which, who they burgled. Um, and then you had the Freedom of Information Act. And it's good to see Richard Thomas here was the first uh, commissioner uh, of, of uh, information commissioner under that act. Um, so I, I thought, well, well, I was, he will, Richard, let me say this before Richard does, that, that um, I was a bit ambiguous about it because I, I was in favor of um, providing a lot more information provided it didn't embarrass me too much. Uh, uh, I think that's a, a fair way of putting it. Um, but the, the, um, I thought that if there was more and more information made available from what happened in government, that trust would go up. Anyway, um, quite, although I'm quite clear this was, it was the right thing to do, trust uh, has actually gone the other way. And I, and I wonder whether it, this is one of those areas, I mean, I, we've got to do it, uh, but uh, there's a, li a line in uh, uh, one of the, the four quartets of Go, 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 said the bird. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Uh, and and um, should we have just kept, I, I don't think so, but kept the myth going um, that, that uh, and, and kept much uh, of government in the dark. My last point, Peter, and this is by far the most serious, uh, uh, is, is that... Um, you, I think you, you, you had to go at uh, the Nolan principles were being written on the back of an envelope. Now, what I want to know is what's wrong with things written <laughs> on the back of an envelope? Because isn't it not the case that some of the, the finest lines in poems, uh, the, 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 the finest themes, uh, musical themes, finest lines in plays have almost certainly been written on the back of an envelope and they're all the better for the fact that they were simply, they, what was being recorded was inspiration rather than gurgitation. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, is and how it could best be restored. Thank you. But, yeah, then, yeah. Um, let's take two or three, assuming that there are other people who'd like to ask questions. Yes, there's another one here. Hi, my name is Miriam. Um, I work in data analytics and insights um, in reputation. Um, so my question is a bit of a personal one. I'd like to know what is it like transitioning from a position of scrutiny as a journalist to being someone who's actively playing a role in government? Excellent, thank you. Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't quite fully catch it. Sorry, yeah. Um, so what, what's it like going from being a journalist oh. to someone who's observing things and sharing <laughs> that with the world to being someone who plays a role in government? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, uh, one more? Yeah, one more. Yeah. Is there one more? We will try and get another at least yeah. another round in. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll start this way round. Um, it's it's a it's a wonderful question. Um, it's more even more extreme than you you, you stated it because um, on my last day as a journalist at the end of June two thousand and ten, I got a phone call at lunchtime from uh, Jeremy Hayward, who was then the permanent secretary at uh, Number Ten. Um, saying um, he, he would, um, the Prime Minister, in fact, in other words, it, it meant the Cabinet Secretary and him, um, would like me to join the detainee inquiry, which was looking at rendition and so on. That was on my last day as a journalist. I'd vaguely heard of the, the issue uh, and so on. And so I went, which is why I became a Privy Councillor. I, I was then told two days later we've got to make you a member of Privy Council because of secrecy. The uh, secrecy is which dates back to Queen Elizabeth the first time. It hasn't been modernized since then, um, um, which is about you know, which keeps things secret. And so that was brought home to me in extreme, going from a journalist to um, seeing some of the inside of government, indeed some very top secret stuff. And I remember, um, I'll keep this very brief, I, I remember we had certain disclosures in relation to, which are now all become public, um, one particular issue, and one of the secretariat rang me, and the secretary of the inquiry is here tonight, but one of his um, staff rang me and, and said, can you come in, Peter, and look at this, this material? And then said, what would you have made of this if you'd been a journalist? I'd, I, and I replied, I'd have had six front page stories. Um, <laughs> but the secrecy was treated, trusted. So it, it, was, it, was, it was strange. Um, the, the answer to your question is a very interesting one. It was strange, but it, it happened, that was some kind of extreme example. And then becoming appointments commissioner, I'd anyway, uh, running the Institute for Government, um, been very involved very closely with government in its operation. So it, it, it wasn't quite as stark as I, I described. But nonetheless, it, it was a difference in perspective. And also meant, curiously, um, I was the most unleaky um, person in government imaginable because I knew all the tricks. Um, and, and therefore, when I got rung up, I knew exactly the potential tricks. Now, on Anthony's uh, question, which is a very interesting one. I'm inclined to turn it back on him and saying the problem of special advisors. Because there's a, there's a partial element of truth, particularly you know, one of the earliest chocolate soldiers, as they were known, when Jack was a special advisor to Barbara Castle, um, is that the traditional relationship was built on civil servants giving um, advice to ministers and so on. The introduction of special advisors, which in many respects I strongly welcome, I'm the best of them, and some very good ones work for Jack, um, really good ones. And, and you know, with you and your colleagues working for Ken Clark, as, as you did, uh, Anthony, as we well remember, um, were, were extremely good. And they provided an added dimension to the work of a Secretary of State and a minister. I think the problem is it opens up the relationship and it creates, in, in some respects, it works very well. And I think it's very, I mean, you know, what I hear from civil servants is that it's very important to them to know what the Secretary of State is thinking. The, the special advisors can do things civil servants can't or sh can't and shouldn't do. However, it does make the relationships more difficult. And that's, for example, Francis Maud on a Sunday revived his greatest hits in The Observer, going back to a lot of things he did as Minister for the Cabinet Office back in the 2010-14 um, um, uh, period, which I worked, we did the government work with him on, and quite familiar stuff on that. And he wants to introduce a more specifically political element at some levels. But I, I think that produces and that frays the relationship. And I think that's what's frayed the relationship. And um, as well as social media, um, a topic which I could well have discussed at length earlier on because there's so many aspects of that, all that has opened things up and it created much more friction and a blame culture, 
think also it goes back to what Jack was saying on Brexit. That has produced strains, exaggerated strains, because my observation quite closely was certainly the majority of the civil service, however reluctant, they did work very hard. And some of the people who got pushed out were actually trying to make a success of what was a very difficult um, um, referendum decision to interpret. And that's a lot of it, as you well know from your, your Brussels experience, actually. So I, I think all those produced a strain, and I think it is difficult now. I, I, I'm suspicious of attempts to say, give civil servants performance targets, because they can't have isolated performance targets, because the, 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 many of the decisions are inherently political. They're not clear cut. You can say, all right, um, administer passports uh, when there aren't strikes. Um, that's a clear cut executive decision. But an awful lot of decisions civil servants are involved in are, have to be referred back to ministers all the time because they're political. So I, I'm, I'm suspicious of that. I think they have to be inter interact, there has to be an interaction. But it comes back to, in the best ministers, um, of self restraint and also an appointment of advisors, people uh, uh, who have some experience but also aren't immediately looking around to either go and work in a lobbying firm or to become an MP. And there was a gap with you anyway, Jack, before you came an MP. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure there are more people who want to come in. Let's, let's take some more. Oh, now, now all the hands are going up. Um, Richard Thomas was mentioned, and he's nearest to the microphone, so let's start with him. Well, thank you very much, uh, Meg. Yes, uh, Jack put the spotlight on me a little bit. I was the Information Commissioner, but I also did serve on the uh, Committee on Standards in Public Life, and I'm currently a member of the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments. So, uh, in Peter's uh, derogatory language, I'm a quangocrat, I suppose. Um, <laughs> that was in quotes, Richard. <laughs> um, I, I rather agree with Jack about trust not being a great rationale for freedom of information. We quietly dropped it during my time because it was perfectly clear that the more people knew about what was going on, the less they trusted government. So I think we would say there are many other rationales for freedom of information, but trust, I think, perhaps took a, a second place um, along the way. My question, though, is for Peter. You didn't say a great deal, Peter, surprisingly, given your background, about the role of the media. Uh, the role of the media in holding uh, ministers and government uh, to account. Um, I think it's fair to say the media are a great deal less deferential than when you started your career in journalism. Um, and perhaps the influence is going greater all the time. But what about the ethics of the media? Um, Leveson had quite a lot to say on that particular subject. Let's not go into uh, that sort of area, but the ethics in the sense of sort of publicizing what is sexist in terms of you know, getting the newspapers and the uh, radio and television greater coverage. Uh, do you think that's a good or a bad thing? And are there ways in which the media could exercise, I forget your exact phrase now, but I think it was more um, self-restraint in exercising their responsibilities. Goodness, we could debate that for a good hour, couldn't we? Should we, should we take, I can see another question from a familiar face just behind Richard near the microphone, and then we'll come over here afterwards. But maybe on a yeah. third round, if we dare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You mean me, do you? Yes, tell us, who, <laughs> okay. tell us who you are. <laughs> so Alan Rennick from the Constitution Unit. Um, many thanks, Peter, that, that was great. Um, you talked at the end of the lecture about the importance of a culture of self-restraint, as Richard was also referring to there, but among politicians uh, and those in public life. What practically can be done to foster that culture? Oh, he always asks hard questions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah shall, I, shall I do those, yeah. those two? Um, it's certainly one thing, both replying to um, um, Jack and you, Richard, in your Committee on Science and Life had, as you will well remember from the review, we looked at the, I looked at the principles as part of the training review. And um, one of the best, um, uh, and we invited um, comments, and from, from one of the best suggestions to, to extend the principles came from the saying that my local councillors don't turn up. So what about something about assiduity? And I thought it wasn't a bad one. But what actually, the interesting point on that was the principles have stood up perfectly well. I mean, the back of the envelope was a descriptive point, not saying, and as you, as you well know, Richard, they, they've been endlessly debated. And successive chairs, um, Paul View and Johnson Evans would say, you know, you, could all, you, you, you might have a different list and you reinterpret them, but actually they stood up pretty, pretty well on that. On the media, yeah, you think an extra hour, I had to think an extra lifetime um, um, to discuss it. I, 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 I mean, Jack and I have talked about this endlessly over the decades. Um, 
I'm, I, I'm perhaps cynical, well, I'm very cynical about whether you can actually lay down requirements. I mean, you mentioned Leveson, and if Brian Leveson was here, I think he'd almost certainly agree um, on that. Um, the, the, in a sense, it's pious hope. As long as you accept the principles of freedom of the press, um, you, um, it's very difficult to tell the um, son or male how to behave. And I'm afraid, I, I don't see, I mean, apart from court cases, and you know, some very interesting ones going on at present, over you know, clear illegality, um, 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 which are very interesting. I, apart from that, I think it's very difficult to mandate it all. And I, I think that the, I, I had more sympathy with regulation than virtually all my journalistic colleagues, but I just, I just don't think it really works. What does, what, the, what can work is having outlets which um, uh, expose um, uh, hypocrisy, wrongdoing. In many fact, social media has done that. I mean, if you look at Twitter, um, there's a very vigorous debate um, on um, Twitter about what's said in various papers, which never happened before, because there was a, a kind of dog doesn't eat dog attitude. Um, I hope I'm not offending any dog lovers, but um, um, in the past, to media commenting on media, um, but now social the social media does enable quite a vigorous debate on people who go over the top and so on and so forth. I mean. It sounds a bit pious. I mean, um, uh, Joshua Rosenberg is here, who's, who's looked at this in more detail than I have. And it, and and I, I but I I'm, I don't believe there are easy answers on on on, on that at all. Um, uh, 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 to, to do that. Sorry, Alan, remind me of your question again. How can you foster a culture of self restraint? Oh, again, it's it's actually related. Sorry, it's related to the previous answer. Only by exposure. Um, and um, comment. And the fact that, I mean, uh, uh, Jack hinted in his remarks that when we first got to know each other um, 40 years ago or more, um, there was a very closed world. Um, that it, was, it was print media, by them, them being printed on hot metal. Fans of James Graham's play Inc. Would, would, will understand that. Um, there, were, there were only three TV channels, uh, mobile phone, the internet, mm -hmm. You were dealing with a closed world, um, which didn't really produce the comment. And, 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 but I think with the opening up of the world, again, excesses can be uh, exposed. Now, it has a bad side, too. It can be trivial uh, and all that. But it can also be a good side. Um, and I, I think there can be a good side in, in calling out bad behavior. I mean, it, it, again, it sounds rather pious and empty, but it's the best you can hope for. In a, in, as long as you accept freedom of expression and, and so on. I mean, I, I, I watched the last two Prime Minister's questions um, um, through masochism, I suppose, and um, it was awful. It's awful. Uh, but all you can do is comment on it and say how ghastly it is. You know, the, 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 you know, there are two reasonable people um, fighting to the bottom. Maybe a good time to uh, tell the audience that Alan has his own inaugural lecture on, I think, the 16th of May, when he's going to talk about how to fix politics. So, uh, he's just looking to crib your ideas for his own lecture. Um, there are now lots of hands going up. There were a couple over here, which I promised. And Peter, I don't know how long... No, it's fine. Long yeah, you're far away. I'm going. We, yeah. strictly speaking, should have finished already. Yeah. <laughs> Rupert Jackson, retired judge. Indeed. What, if any, will be the effect of the Dominic Raab saga on the future conduct Okay, and there's a woman here. And maybe we could take three in this round. There's another woman here, because there's lots of hands going up. And then if you want another round, there's plenty more. Um, hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a second year undergraduate here at UCL. Um, and I was just kind of thinking about, given public trust in the executives sitting around the 35% mark, and considering also that democracy in the UK's constitution itself is so reliant on public trust, how do we rebuild that, not only within Westminster through this kind of self-restraint principles, also then with the public and do you see there a role for the media if it's to fully retain this role of exposure how can we ever rebuild trust without effectively just ripping the system down and starting all over again and if you want more exercise ed there's, there's one here yes. <laughs> hi um, my name is francesca and i'm a phd student uh, here at ucl um, and i was very interested 
it, very interested to hear the subject of intelligence and freedom of information mentioned because I study intelligence, but I study mainly the US. And I'm just wondering because our Freedom of Information Act is a lot more restrictive than the US in terms of intelligence and what we declassify. And I'm wondering to what extent do you think that might be related to the fact that the US does have a written constitution and I feel like they have more of a sense of, okay, this is what we are. We are entitled to this information. Whereas the UK, we we don't we don't have that really in the same way and I, and I wonder to what extent that means that that's translated into I would argue less of a, a transparent um, society in terms of declassification of, of information and what, what your thoughts are and kind of quickly connected if um, any of the speakers can answer when our um, Freedom of Information Act was being formulated was there any question of perhaps um, making intelligence agencies um, included or was that just not even up for question? I feel like Jack is being tempted into the questions here. So you have a go, Peter, and if you want to hand it on, I'm sure you'd, um, we can break all the rules and have the respondent answering the questions. Yeah, and too. there's a guy up there. Do you want to take the last one yeah. and make it a full question, maybe a final round? OK, sorry, Ed, back up there. <laughs> Hi, thank you. My name's Nick. Um, a related question is a very important issue regarding uh, the information in regards to media. Is the cabal of billionaires that own it, of course, the excess of Russia and the US? They gave us the cabal of Brexit and Trump. <laughs> These people have no excess. So, what safeguards can we take for dirty money? Very interesting one. I'll leave the FOA one to later because I mean, Jack will, can answer more of that than, than I, I can. Um, on, 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 on Rupert, nice to see you again. Um, we, um, we've known each other for 50 years. Um, and um, the impact of the, the rather, fair, there are two issues there. One is complaints procedures, which is a very specific one, where I think everyone agrees that it was unsatisfactory. But wasn't, after when um, the KC was called in, there wasn't an independent advisor on Ministry of Interest who would normally be the person who would instigated. I mean, I think actually there are advantages in having um, a fully legally trained person do an inquiry on something as complicated as this. But the interpretation in relation to the code, which appears to be done rather hurriedly last Thursday, when uh, Laurie Magnus, the independent advisor, was called into number 10, I, I think you one would restructure that. Above all, as the First Division Association and my old organization, Institute for Government, have organized, uh, argued you need a, a different compl uh, complaints procedures. I mean, the current procedures are totally unsatisfactory. On the other question, which I partly tackled, was I think it will. It is already stirring a debate on civil service ministerial uh, relations. I mean, uh, the, the 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 point uh, Anthony Teasdale and others have raised. So I think there, there, it will further stir that. I'm I'm very struck by the public administration committee has decided to have a specific inquiry into this. Um, but I think it, the tensions, those who want to have a go at the civil service will feel free reign because of the way Dominic Raab phrased his statement of resignation. And I think this will stir along. I'm sure in many respects, the last thing he wants is this. Um, um, but I think it will further expose this debate. I think there's some very big questions for Labour in this. I mean, Labour says quite a few things he would like to do, but I'm not sure it's fully thought them out on that. And the civil service relationship, especially as one uh, sees today that Sue Gray may, may not be helping um, um, Keir Starmer for quite some time. Not exactly a surprising outcome. So, but I think there's a, a, there will be a debate on that, but it further highlights a, a growing mistrust. On trust, um, uh, it goes back to um, 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 trust, run trust. Um, on trust, I think I, I, I you, you used to look at some, quite a lot of the polling on that. One of the jobs I did when I was a journalist was, was um, work on opinion polling. And also, the Hansard Society, we set up, um, and it's still going, a, an annual um, uh, polling on uh, public attitudes to Parliament and various other related things. And what is quite clear on that is that, all right, things like the MP's expenses row have a shock effect on public trust, and um, you can pick out various other ones. But actually, it's much more correlated to people's kind of bread and butter experiences. If you want to increase trust in government, cut inflation, boost living standards, um, um, those are the actual things. And that's what people, people or they're affected by when there's a big scandal. Um, and that becomes a talking point and so on. Some of the events, spectacular events in the last 18 months are briefly talking points. But 
in most people, perfectly understandably, it's their livelihoods, but they relate that to trusting government. They think government isn't performing because of all the things that are happening to their lives. So I'd be very I'm very wary uh, of assuming, and this is behind partly something Richard Thomas referred to, a belief um, that you could um, uh, 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 suddenly change it with new regulations, new regulations and all that, which isn't an argument against having safeguards, but not believing it would have much effect. And indeed, some of the transparency, um, Jack experienced this you know, when, when, he, when he, he period uh, as a cabinet minister, some of the things he was doing um, didn't have a positive effect because more was being disclosed on that. Now, as billionaires, um, um, there, uh, I mean, there, there are two separate things. There. There's the media bit. Um, and um, and as, as my former employer, Rupert Murdoch, um, who I only met two or three times, um, is now experiencing, they're not immune. I mean, if you see what Fox is paying out at present, this is an incredible story. Um, and um, it, it, it has all the um, aspects of classic drama, what's happened there. And um, you, it, it doesn't sustain itself forever. Um, but the successive prime ministers have retreated from things on foreign ownership and so on, um, because they're, I think, un, unduly frightened of the media. Uh, uh, you know, Richard was right when he said, oh, the, the debates changed, the media has a greater role, it's less deferential, and I was describing how closed it was when I started. That has changed, but still, I think people overrate the influence. Um, because people see something, particularly on social media now, they think it matters. Um, a lot of things don't matter very much, and certainly, going back to the last question of trust, people don't notice um, very much. Um, um, people, I mean, it, it, um, when I was doing the polling, the polling organization used to do focus groups. And I used to talk to the um, 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 guy who, who ran it. We'd all, all, all have, often have a chat about it. And he'd be up in, invariably in, in Luton <coughs> on a cold um, February evening. And he would report on what the focus group showed. And what had been the main talking point in Westminster the day before made not the slightest impact. No one had noticed. And it, 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 permeating through to Jack's old constituents in Blackburn is a pretty hard thing to do. Um, fire, feisty Lancastrians, there they were. Um, but it, someone shouldn't exaggerate some, some of these things. On, 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 on FOI, I think as a significant, leaving aside intelligence agency's point, um, as FOI is a broader cultural change um, in opening up Select committees, um, which Jack said you know, massively expanded in, in 79 and have been sustained. Televising parliament, don't underrate that at all. Um, um, social media, those have been as important and a different generation of people who want to be more open. Nonetheless, there is, I wouldn't deny that there can be, I, I found it funny enough coming in, uh, in answer to the earlier question, when I became appointments commissioner, I think it'd be fair to say, and my former senior advisor is sitting here, and she, I hope she endorses that, I probably had a more open attitude than, than quite a lot of people, because I believed in engaging with Parliament and outsiders, because that's what you should do. You should be, obviously, the, the, the confidentiality things on names and so on, you should engage. That, I think, was as important as FOI. Did you want to add anything, Jack? Okay. And then I fear we should wrap this up because uh, I've been a very bad chair for timekeeping and yes. keeping you from a drink. My, my apologies. Yes, please. Um, I, I'm, the, 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 the first question you asked was, was there greater openness in the US uh, over intelli releasing intelligence matters because they have a written constitution? I don't think so. I mean, some things in the US system are kept... You know, very significantly under wraps. On the other hand, they do uh, ru routinely release most of their secret files uh, some decades uh, before um, the UK does. Uh, and uh, to detain you brief for uh, one quick story, I wrote a book about Britain's relationship with Iran. There was a US-UK coup, or org organized coup, uh, in 1953 in Iran, which um, removed the then uh, Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh uh, and restored the Shah to his, the power he had. Um, and I made a tentative inquiry uh, through the Cabinet Office of whether the records 
our records were available and was reminded that I'd, when I was, had been foreign secretary, I'd firmly endorsed the policy that these records should never become available. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I did a bit of digging and found exactly what I wanted uh, on the uh, uh, National Archive uh, website of the United States. Uh, I mean, exactly, so it, 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 there, there it was. Uh, the other was, was there any, any um, consideration given to making intelligence uh, matters uh, subject to FOI? I mean, no, we, we simply, no, not at all. So, so that it's, it's uh, subject to an absolute exclusion. Thank you very much. Now, I'm just going to end with some thank yous. But, but first to say, um, I've mentioned Alan's lecture uh, coming up uh, in, what is that, three weeks? Um, I see that sitting in front of us, we have the person who's giving the inaugural lecture next week, Professor Lauga Polson, on the 4th of May, is going to be speaking about the politics of international property rights. Uh, so do come back and listen to that. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, Obviously, huge thanks to Peter and welcome again to the UCL Fold. Thank you to Jack uh, for your response and indeed your responses. And I'd particularly like to extend thanks to those who helped to organise this event, which again includes Professor Alan Rennick, um, Eleanor Kingwell Bannum, who's standing at the back, and uh, Ed Rowe, and indeed numerous others, I expect, who I don't know to mention. So thank you very much to the organisers. Thank you to you. And thank you above all else to our speakers. Yeah, yeah.